welcome back again. Brian here, and today we're going to be talking about colonial Christmas traditions. And starting, of course, with England's and, and, and Englishmen's uh, first documented Christmases in the Americas here at Jamestown. And uh, we actually begin before even making it to Jamestown. Uh, the very first expedition leaves England at the end of 1606, and we see them departing uh, from London uh, on December 20th. And they end up getting, uh, once they're out into the English Channel, befouled. And so the weather basically has them stuck. They can't make forward progress. And so they spend that fir very first Christmas riding anchor, freezing in, in the English Channel, waiting for weather conditions to improve. And unfortunately, we have no reference one way or the other as to whether or not they made any attempt uh, to practice any observances there aboard ship. Uh, a year later, they've been in the colony for several months, and by the time Christmas uh, rolls around uh, for the first time here in Virginia, we see uh, resupply is already late. And so conditions are already not ideal. Uh, Captain John Smith has been captured and, and, and by the Powhatan and spends Christmas uh, and much of that winter as a prisoner. And immediately following the Christmas season, uh, basically right after the 12th day of Christmas, we see an accidental fire get out of hand and burn most of the fort down. Um, so again, not a very Merry Christmas. Uh, the following winter, we see, uh, again, the colony just not in, uh, not in a, a, in a great stance. And Captain John Smith, once again, not present, now a guest of the Powhatan down at Kikatan, uh, but again, not even in the fortification. And then the winter after that, we see the siege uh, and starving time. And so the first several Christmases involved with the Jamestown story, pretty miserable. Uh, but in general, what these guys would have been familiar with back in England, what they're missing uh, while they're here, uh, you know, suffering hardships in the, the winters of Virginia, um, is a very different sort of tradition for Christmas than what most of us are familiar with today. Uh, you know, early 17th century English Christmas traditions uh, and further on back uh, are still influenced by a lot of the religious practices that preceded the introduction of Christianity into the British Isles. And so while Christmas obviously is still very much a key Christian holiday by this time period, it's not necessarily the pinnacle of the Christian calendar as it's it is so somewhat observed in this country today. Easter definitely the um, the most important uh, of of those those Christian holidays, uh, but Christmas again you know still retaining a lot of of residual traditions um, from earlier practices. For one thing, they are celebrating the entirety of the twelve days of Christmas. We talk about it today with our Christmas carols and that sort of thing, but we don't really observe it. Um, and if anything, what we see modern day is the Christmas season beginning very early, especially commercially, uh, and going right up to Christmas, and then pretty much stopping after Christmas Day itself. Uh, whereas historically, the Christmas season does not begin until Christmas Day, and then goes for 12 days, ending with Epiphany. And so uh, we see kind of a 12-day party, essentially. Uh, we see a lot of, of um, holdover from uh, again the the earlier earlier religions uh, involving um, a, a lot of, of well for instance drinking and partying and carousing and that sort of thing um, you know wazzling for instance being sort of the 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 genesis of the somewhat more modern practice of caroling. What's that? What's that? What's that? Uh, but door-to-door -door partying, if you will, you've got a, a group of, of, of revelers uh, going door-to-door, -door, um, essentially begging for drink and threatening to sing at the homeowner if they, they're not forthcoming. You know, we see very popular in the time period the practice of the Lord of Misrule, electing an individual uh, from the lower classes, by the lower classes, to sort of... Uh, 
run the festivities at, at, at Christmas, electing a mock court, um, and in addition to sort of planning and, and running a lot of the festivities, uh, taking the opportunity to sort of poke fun at the upper classes, the ruling classes, uh, you know, poking fun at, at uh, you know, even the church and interrupting government functions, interrupting church functions, uh, and this sort of thing. It's, it's sort of an opportunity for the lower classes to let their hair down and blow off some steam. You know, most of the rest of the year, they've got their nose seriously to the grindstone. Uh, and so the, the 12 days of Christmas kind of seen as, as, as you could say, almost a pressure release valve, uh, giving the lower classes a, a, a chance to, to relax uh, for a few days. Uh, gambling, illegal for the majority of the common classes for the majority of the year, legal during Christmas. Uh, again, a kind of a popular opportunity to, to have some fun. Um, we see uh, the practice of you know decorating with greenery and that sort of thing, uh, but what uh, has become so common in our country today with the Christmas tree, not around just yet. That will come into the picture much later on uh, as a tradition borrowed uh, from Germany, and so we see uh, you know greenery, festooning you know homes and that sort of thing. And uh, of course, the things like like holly and and other evergreens popular because those are the things that kind of still give you some semblance of life through the you know dead looking part of the year that that is winter and sort of that promise that yes spring will come around again. Um, and so we see this again this this sort of of you know, 12 day booze up drunken revelry version of Christmas that seems somewhat alien, uh, oftentimes from a modern perspective. Uh, and I think it is also, uh, there, there, there is, it, there is a, um, a tendency, I, I think sometimes in learning about these traditions, um, to assume that that's all it is, that, that, that it's just this, this, you know, the whole country is is falling down drunk for 12 days and they're just partying. It does not belittle the religious significance of the holiday for them at all. They are still observing, um, you know, the religious importance of Christmas. You've got all sorts of religious aspects to it. They're just also partying along with it in a little bit different aspect than what we'll see later on. Um, and uh, ultimately, this kind of comes to a close uh, in the middle of the 1600s with the English Civil War and ultimately the, the Puritan movement coming to political power in England. And uh, I think it'd be fair to say the Puritans, not big on fun. And so a lot of the more traditional and, and still reminiscently pagan uh, traditions tied with Christmas are outlawed and Christmas, Christmas becomes a day of, of um, sort of uh, you know solemn reflection of fasting and prayer and that sort of thing, rather than this this twelve day carousing party. Uh, and this is the break. This is why we don't see the Lord of Misrule uh, practiced modern day. It's why we don't really see um, and, and, you know again caroling eventually revived as sort of a pale reflection of the. Um, uh, of 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 the uh, the wassailing, um, but it's it's where that's where these traditions went, or where the break is. Uh, we see Christmas all but canceled, essentially under the Puritan regime, and England goes for the better part of a century with not doing a whole lot in the way of celebrating around the Christmas season beyond the the base religious observances. And in the mid to late 18th century, we see kind of a popular movement to now start trying to revive England's merry old Christmas traditions. Uh, and to talk a little bit more about that, we're going to uh, go and talk with our friends at Yorktown. Merry Christmas. My name is Carrie. You're at the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown, and we're talking a little bit about Colonial Christmas. 
One thing that was common in the 18th century was decorating with greens. Um, and for that, we have some different greens that we have around here on the farm uh, that I've collected to tie into little bundles so we can decorate our house with it. So just gonna take a few of these and just like if I were gonna make an arrangement today, just kind of group them pleasantly so that they can show off a little bit about what we're doing. And this just adds a little bit of color. Um, whether we're talking about Christmas today or Christmas in the 18th century, um, this is a time of year, at least for us in the Northern Hemisphere, that is a little darker and we want to try to make it more cheerful. Now, when we're talking about decorating in the 18th century, there are of course gonna be some differences to how we would decorate our houses today uh, in the 21st century. So for instance, I don't have a Christmas tree in the 18th century. That's more of a, a German tradition and so it's not gonna be com uh, become common in the 18th century in English speaking countries until more of the 19th century. Uh, and that's gonna be introduced pretty much by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, there's also not as uh, many things like wreaths or even decorating a lot with fruit. You're not really doing that. For the most part, we would have maybe a little bit of green greenery strewn about our, our hall and parlor. Uh, of course, candlelight is still pretty big and, and that would have been common in the 18th century as well just because you need it it's dark um as i mentioned we're also not going to be decorating as much with fruit um i don't know i, I really like a, a nice bowl full of oranges and apples and it was always tradition in my family at least to find oranges and apples and nuts in my christmas stocking growing up um but those would be treats, something like an orange. But again, we're just not gonna, we're not gonna decorate it with it. And we're not gonna be putting it in our stockings because that's something else that we are not doing in the colonies in the 18th century. But when we are talking about decorating with something like an orange, we might also be talking about um, putting these little guys in there. So this is a clove and both cloves and oranges smell good. And even today, the scent of those things do a call to mind Christmas. Um, and this is called a pomander. And all we're gonna do is stick these cloves into the skin of the orange. And I mean, it's just that, it's just gonna smell good. That's, that's all this is for. Most of the time we would be carrying the pomanders around with us to help us in turn smell good. Again, those aren't necessarily gonna be something that we're leaving around our houses, but they could make a good centerpiece. The origin of the pomander starts back in the Middle Ages and wouldn't have been a piece of fruit in that time period. Uh, we would have had maybe a metal ball or a wooden ball that then has essentially oils added to it to make it smell nice and you again would wear that on your person um that was a time period when of course they don't have a germ theory and one idea of where disease comes from is called the miasma theory and it's basically that disease is is going to be coming directly from bad smells so if you have something that smells good on your person, then that's gonna help ward off any of those diseases that might attack you. Another Christmas tradition is something that is still to an extent practiced in England, maybe not so much here in the United States, uh, but that's gonna be Boxing Day. Um, Boxing Day is going to originate by a, with a box like this being kept on the mantle. Um, the white English farmer or planter would put money in this throughout the year. And on Boxing Day, he would then distribute the money to any of his enslaved people or servants or children. Um, 
gift giving is a little different than it is today. Uh, for the most part, children or servants or enslaved people are not going to be gifting things up to their parents or to their masters. Um, it's only going to be going down, so it's not reciprocal. Other than money, uh, other things that might be gifted are going to be small gifts. They're, of course, not going to gift Xboxes or Playstations or anything like that. Uh, but we do see things like books being given to children um, other than just money. Uh, occasionally, little pieces of candy. Uh, again, food is a very big part of Christmas, uh, even in the 18th century. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm coming to you from the American Revolution Museum in Yorktown. I am here at our example of what an enslaved person's house might have looked like and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what enslaved folks could expect around the holiday season in Tidewater, Virginia. One of the things that we talk about here is the fact that enslaved folks were not always able to count on the same standards of living conditions. Uh, a lot of that would depend on the enslaver and what he felt was appropriate. And so that led to a lot of different kind of living conditions and working conditions for enslaved folks. And that would also be reflected around the holidays. A lot of slaveholders in the area and in the South in general, uh, they would have had enslaved folks that maybe they didn't need their labor on their personal property or their farm. So they would lease those enslaved folks out for the year. And usually these lease contracts for enslaved labor would uh, begin on January 1st and they would end sometime around what we consider the holiday season. And that at that point would be when they re would return home to uh, their, their home that they originated from. So at that point, anybody that was an enslaved person who had been out on a, a lease contract, they would return and they'd be able to visit family members, perhaps children, perhaps spouses. They would be able to take advantage of the slaveholder. Uh, today, we would not really consider it gift giving. We would consider it the bare minimum, but they could count on getting their clothing allotment of fabric maybe some extra food rations. Uh, oftentimes on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, they could count on getting some coins and small tokens from the slaveholder. And even the enslaved folks that had been out on contracts could take advantage of that by coming home for the holiday season. They would be able to be better fed, rest a bit more than they were used to because it's the cooler part of the year, not as much labor to be done. and right as soon as January 1st comes up, they'd be departing to start their new contract. So that small respite from their day-to-day -day grind would uh, be all really that they could look forward to at the end of the year. And I think that's a big takeaway from this is uh, the fact that most enslavers would give these people a, a small window of hope at the end of the year. And hope could be a dangerous thing. So it could be the one thing that keeps them coming back year to year and not running away to somewhere else. Uh, the fact that they would have the promise of seeing their family and their loved ones at the end of the year uh, would perhaps keep them from causing problems, so to speak. So while we think about what the free farmer was doing during the holiday season, I think it's really important to put yourselves in the position of these people that didn't have a lot of day-to-day -day choices because their rights had been taken away from them. They were literally considered property. And uh, that's something that's powerful to think about. When we think about the holidays here in the United States, we tend to think of uh, family gatherings and festivities and that kind of thing. A lot of those traditions really uh, come from the 19th century. In the 18th century, Christmas is a religious holiday. And certainly in the army, it's not gonna be a great time of festivities. In the winter time, the men are going into their winter quarters, preparing for a long stretch of several months waiting for the spring thaw. One of their duties will be to build winter cabins and prepare preparation for this. It's a time of isolation, it's a time of hardship, and a lot of times uh, lack of food and clothing. Um, when people do mention Christmas in their diaries, usually they just mention the fact that it was Christmas Day. 
One soldier mentioned mending his breeches. Another said uh, there's nothing worthy of remarks. Though there are going to be a few uh, high points, perhaps. Uh, at Valley Forge, Washington did issue the men a gill, which is about a half a cup of whiskey or rum, to help ease their suffering. Um, sometimes men were able to go home on furlough if the winter camps were close enough to where they lived. But for the most part, the men were stuck where they were, miserable and cold and damp. Uh, though sometimes you do see accounts of the officers going to nearby farms and being able to celebrate with the families there. But for the typical soldier, it was uh, a long, miserable time. Not the festive thing we tend to associate with the holidays today. I'd like to thank you for joining us and for watching our video about the holiday season in the 17th and 18th century. Please follow us on our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, please hit the notification button and subscribe to our channel. Uh, we post new videos very regularly, once if not twice a week. So if you're enjoying what you're seeing here on our channel, please come back and see us. And come and visit us in person at the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown and at Jamestown Settlement. wreaths all I'm watching you stop that get out of my house right you better listen all right